Well, good evening. Welcome to our EBS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we introduce our speaker this evening, we'd like to give you an overview of the free program for those attending for the first time. So we'll go over who we are, what is our program, some new programs that we're excited about to speak talking about, introduce our speaker, and then there will be a Q&A. So again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness and Chronic Pain Partners nonprofit organization based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, uh, leads the Cleveland, Ohio, EDS support group. She was diagnosed with hypermobile EDS in 2008, the same year my wife, Carol, passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. So we introduced our program in 2012, leading a conference to help those with EDS and related disorders uh, form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We've been sponsored for these conferences for over seven years. We started over 115 groups to date. And each group is given their own free website with a link to the directory and map. We receive feedback with conferences, provide valuable information and social opportunities that many cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We typically meet monthly. Again, all the programs are free in the meeting, announcements, and whenever possible, the webinar recordings are posted on our website for future replay. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Sport Store, where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. Proceeds from this store and donations to our nonprofit organization help fund our program. Please visit our store and check out the helpful products that we offer. Just a general disclaimer of the presentation contains general information about EDS. Members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in this program. Everybody the information is here. not advice. Uh, please mute yourself. The information is not advice if you're having medical problems. Now, please call 911 for the medical services in your community. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to you. So our physician CME educational program was introduced in September of 2015. It provides free educational credits to physicians who need to renew their license. It has received an overwhelming response from the medical community. More than 900 registered participants are involved. It is the first EDS course providing CME credits. It covers the diagnosis, classification, and treatment of older families and associated conditions. We encourage you to promote this program with your Positions, you can get a brochure on the website. It's ailersdanloscme.org or provide that link to the position. 
There's also a webinar on our site on the first front page that gives you more details about that program. We're also uh, becoming accredited to provide CEUs for that, those and similar programs. So uh, you are upcoming speakers and visit the webinar page at pbsawareness.com for future inquiries. So again, our presenter this evening is Dr. Patrick Agnew. He's going to be speaking about foot and ankle treatment for EDS. Dr. Agnew is past president of the American College of Foot and Ankle Pediatrics and the Hampton Roads Podiatric Medical Society. Dr. Agnew has been board certified foot and ankle surgery since 1990. He was trained in microvascular surgery in uniform services, University of Health Sciences. He's on the board of the Ehlers Daniels Society Medical and Scientific. Society Group. He's a founder and director of the Eastern Virginia Medical School of Pediatric Medicine and Surgery Residencies. He's a member of the American Pediatric Medical Association. And he's a pediatric section editor of the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery. He's a captain in the United States Navy Reserve, retired. He was decorated for service during the Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield. So we're looking forward to this presentation by Dr. Patrick Anglin, and I'll pull up your slides right now. So uh, good evening, Dr. Uh, Hi, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me well? I can hear you well. It could be that they can hear you better than maybe they heard me. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, welcome, and uh, and thanks again for coming this evening. You'll see, uh, I don't know if you can see, but I have about 37 slides to go through, some of which I'll go through pretty promptly. Others we'll, we'll linger on a bit. Um, I thought I'd try something a little bit different this year with, with two other presentations out there. This is actually the same presentation I would give to an audience of medical professionals. Uh, it's been my experience that many, if not most, of the patients that I see with ehlers demo Syndrome uh, and related disorders uh, seem to know uh, a lot about it. So um, this will actually be beneath a lot of the a lot of the audience, um, some of the newer uh, people wel welcome, and uh, you you'll learn quickly not from my presentation about Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, but you'll learn about uh, at least what we're currently doing to try to help with foot and ankle related problems. Uh, if you can, see, I hope you can see my cursor. This is my daughter. She doesn't always have face paint on but she was at Bush Gardens with my son and their significant others. A couple of the gentlemen's faces are kind of obscured. They happen to be special operators, and so we're going to leave them that way. I'm a little obscured. Um, I bring greetings from the American College of Foot and Ankle Pediatrics. I'm now on the board of directors, and we have annual meetings where we talk about foot and ankle problems in children. Uh, on the top left here is Eastern Virginia Medical School's library. Uh, I run a residency program at Eastern Virginia Medical School. This is uh, one of our treatment facilities. Uh, I believe that's uh, Centera Lee Memorial Hospital, one of the top 40 orthopedic hospitals in, in the nation. And here's the Children's Hospital, the King's Daughters, uh, where we also work in the foreground, and Centera Norfolk General Hospital, 
in the rear, which is uh, one of the top 40 hospitals in the nation in heart, endocrinology, diabetes specifically. Uh, so moving along, we've done a bit of research um, on people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or at least suspected to have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. This first paper back 28 years ago was the second meeting I went to, the second annual meeting of what was then the Ehlers-Danlos National Foundation, happened to be held here in Chesapeake, Virginia, a city right adjacent to Virginia Beach. And uh, I was new in practice. I, I didn't have a whole lot to do, so I went to the meeting. I assumed that people with EDS probably had foot problems, and, and I was right. Out of the dozen or so people that were there, they pretty much all had foot problems. Pat Alessino, the hand surgeon who was the director of the medical advisors panel at that time, uh, approached me partway through the meeting and said, Patrick, are you interested in this? And I said, well, well sure. And he said, well, you know what? Uh, just about everybody we meet is complaining of foot problems and nobody's really studying it. So, um, uh, you know, I guess the next day I was the uh, world's leading authority on foot problems in ehlers demo syndrome. Um, but I, I tried to learn fast and I uh, went to the meeting in Seattle the following year and brought just a little paper survey to the couple of dozen people that were there and circulated. And it was about 100% of people had some sort of foot or ankle problems. And some of them we predicted, and some of them were a little bit of a surprise. And we moved on from there trying to figure out ways to help. Later we uh, took x-rays, or I didn't, but the uh, uh, pediatric orthopedist at Detroit Children's Hospital took x-rays of a lot of feet. And we studied those x-rays, and we found some unexpected findings that we'll, we'll discuss later. Footmax is a, a commercial computer scanner that you, you walk on, and it produces uh, images of the distribution of pressure on the sole of the feet. At that time, uh, 26 years ago, we thought that it probably would be like the EKG of the foot, but it, it really isn't, and you can get basically the same technology by going to Walmart and stepping on the Dr. Scholl's thing and having it tell you what's, what size arch or what kind of arch support you need. Um, but it did provide uh, at least some, some data suggesting um, how pressure is distributed on the soles of the feet of people with, with collagen disease. Um, after that, a few years, I, I published a, a paper in the uh, Clinics of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery describing uh, a, a thought process for approaching people with uh, basically flat feet and trying to figure out is this a flat foot you know, because of congenital formation or maybe problems with neurologic or muscular issues or in many cases connective tissue disorders. So that was a, an early attempt at helping doctors think through what they're seeing clinically and maybe adjust their treatment in a constructive way. Um, we then uh, published some posters uh, on, uh, well, we've published posters every year since uh, several years ago. Uh, one of the earlier ones was uh, the replacement of a ligament on the side of the big toe called the medial collateral ligament in an effort to help keep a toe straight after surgical correction, a problem that we we've seen in, in people with connective tissue disorders, and more on that later. We also published a poster on the tensile strength of that ligament using cadavers and seeing how strong that is so we could come up with the right kind of construct to replace it. Did something similar with uh, ankle ligament durability and, and then some research on uh, using fluorescence angiography. Uh, this slide needs to be updated because we also published a poster at the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons meeting in April in Nashville of this year talking about um, what my residents call the blue plate special for connective tissue disorder, which uh, we'll, we'll show you some illustrations of shortly and our experience with it over the last uh, about five years or seven years. Um, and then there's another paper, or the, an oral presentation that was given at the American Podiatric Medical Association meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. last month, in which our, our second-year resident described our findings of procedure to uh, 
to hold the first toast straight, the same one that the poster was on in uh, 2017 at the APNA meeting. And that's my handsome son who's uh, entering his third year at Virginia Military Institute and his beautiful girlfriend. Um, so uh, I don't have to belabor this much, but when I'm talking to other physicians, I want them to understand that there are a lot of different connective tissue diseases and uh, – and probably the prototype is osteogenesis imperfecta, which affects type 1 collagen and is well-known for pathological fractures. Uh, but then um, the foot manifestations in a lot of syndromes, including EDS, Marfan's, and others, are very similar. And there are, are some, some broad but not universal ideas that can, can be helpful to people with uh, almost any type of connective tissue disorder. There's my uh, older son who was on the U.S. surf team doing a uh, uh, little surfing. He is very flexible but does not have any connective tissue disorder that we're aware of. So there's special considerations we talk to surgeons about when dealing with people, uh, trying to help people with connective tissue disorders. Uh, in many cases, soft tissue handling can be quite challenging, particularly with classic type EDS. Uh, we been described as sewing wet tissue paper together. So we have to be very careful in terms of incisions we make and how we put them back together. Vascular fragility uh, can be present in most types, but particularly in vascular type and requires special attention and dissection and, and uh, repair of uh, surgical incisions. Bone fragility is very common. Whether or not there's a defect in the collagen within the bone uh, because uh, all too often, people with connective tissue disorders can get deconditioned um, for a variety of reasons, including fear of injury, and wind up with inadequate bone density. Um, it's funny how every ligament in your body can be loose, but your Achilles tendon, the largest tendon in your body, the one on the back of your ankle, can still be too tight. Uh, more on that later. Ankle instability is, uh, of course, extremely common in, in humans in general, but particularly in people with connective tissue disorders. Ankle sprains are probably the most common presenting problem in an emergency room, not just for EDS patients, but for everybody. So some common problems we see are uh, hypermobility of the foot where, where it becomes flat, but it doesn't necessarily do a, a specific movement called pronation. It may just be flat um, and ankle instability again. And, yes, my beautiful daughter who um, is married to a sniper, so don't even think about it, guys. Uh, common foot problems that we see sometimes have uncommon manifestations. So something as common as a bunion deformity, you see here on the right, can be accompanied by a leaking joint capsule after an attempted surgical repair and create a pseudotumor, a big lump there, not your typical bunion. Some uncommon manifestations of uh, motion. Of course, you, you are, are all probably aware of uh, the diagnostic maneuvers we do, Byton's criteria, where we move different joints and see how far they move. And uh, this I would suggest only really needs to be done once. And once you're diagnosed, I would not recommend doing this for uh, entertainment purposes. Anytime you move a joint outside of its intended range of motion, you're damaging that joint. Um, though sometimes people like to do tricks and show us how things work, and I'll, I'll be happy to videotape it, and then I don't want you to ever do it again. <laughs> So here's a ligament that's supposed to hold that joint straight it is not working properly. Uh, this is a relatively common birth defect that I actually wrote a chapter in a book on called metatarsus adductus. It's just a particularly profound example of it in a, a patient with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I actually have metatarsus adductus. It's ironic the guy that asked me to write the chapter in the book didn't know that I had it, but he he said, can you write a paper on metatarsis or a chapter on metatarsis and doctors? I Yes, I can. I <laughs> have some personal experience there. Um, here's my son doing what they do for fun at Eastern, at uh, Virginia Military Institute. So after 
going to a number of meetings and and meeting a lot of people here in the in my in my private practice and through our residency program I came up with some suggestions as far as basic principles in trying to help with foot and ankle problems I think we should try to align and maintain functional anatomy there's a tendency for that alignment to be lost over time by walking on weak ligaments and uh, that can create dysfunction. We want to avoid skin injury uh, because in many cases uh, repair of the skin can be difficult. So as we're thinking of ways to intervene, particularly surgical methods, we, we want to make incisions essentially small. Incisions heal from side to side, not from end to end, but we still uh, want to minimize any type of incision. We don't want to rely on ligaments. A lot of orthopedic and podiatric surgical procedures try to take ligaments and uh, rearrange them or tie them together in order to make things work better. But since in the case of foot ligaments, they've often already failed once. Trying to put them back together in the hopes that they're going to work better is, is probably unrealistic. Um, and selecting the appropriate time of intervention. So sometimes it's wise to wait for certain problems to become really disabling before intervening. At other times, it's wise to, to get ahead, to, to do something smaller so you don't have to do something bigger later. Itch in time does, in fact, save nine sometimes. So in terms of aligning uh, and maintaining functional anatomy, I, I don't recommend that you carry around a telephone pole, but um, that's what my son does for fun. Um, arch supports or orthotics are popular but controversial. Unfortunately, there's precious little data on whether or not an arch support positively affects the uh, presence of symptoms or the natural history of what happens to a foot and ankle with, with connective tissue disease. Our clinical impression is they help a lot. And my general recommendation is just about everybody with a connective tissue disease ought to at least be evaluated for potential benefit of using arch supports or orthotics from the Greek to make straight, ortho. Um, that being said, I, I can't tell you the right orthotic to use. Uh, there, there are too many variations. I'm afraid there's more art than science to it, and there remains precious little data. So if someone tells you, um, well, you need this arch support because it's going to prevent a problem for you 20 years from now. I, I can't say that I have data to support that statement, but I can also can't say that I have data to contradict it. Um, certainly, some papers have been published trying to say that orthotics are ineffective because they don't make you grow an arch. Well, glasses don't make your eyeballs straight either, but they can sure help you read, um, and wearing them can be beneficial. Uh, orthotic arch supports may help to stave off some, some big problems later in life, and we often do recommend that they at least be attempted. Now, what they should be made of and how hard or soft or uh, how they should be shaped, that is, that's really something we, we just don't know. There are a lot of opinions and precious little data. Arthrodesis or fusing joints is what's in the old textbooks as a way of helping people with connective tissue disorders. Uh, I have to say the majority of people whom I've met who've had arthrodesis procedures in the foot and ankle are not particularly happy. Um, unfortunately, if you have it, all of your joints are uh, hypermobile or, or uh, too flexible and you fuse one joint, then all the other joints are going to become angry. They're going to have to do more work for that joint that's no longer working at all. And generally speaking, you're, you're, you'll be chasing a chasing a balloon. You'll push in one side and then pop out the other side and you'll never really be able to make the patient comfortable. Osteotomies or cutting bones, moving them, putting back in position, uh can work pretty well. Um, they they are uh, more tolerable and effective. Shortcomings with both arthrodesis and osteotomies is that they often require long periods of immobilization, not bearing weight. So if I have a patient who I'm trying to help with their foot problem and I put them on crutches for three months and they dislocate their shoulders in the process, I'm probably not doing them a favor. So where we can, we try to do, when we when we have to do osteotomies, we, we design very stable ones. 
but when we cut and move bones, we use dovetail and and different types of carpentry tricks to to keep the bones in position and internal fixation materials like screws and plates to hold stuff in position effectively so that the foot can bear weight, albeit sometimes painfully, but enough so that the patient doesn't have to hazard their knees and hips and shoulders to get over a, a foot surgery. Um, uh, arthroresis or talotarsal joint uh, stent is controversial also. Again, unfortunately, there's not enough good long-term data on efficacy, although that data is growing. And I've done some meta-analysis on the papers that are out there, and the vast majority uh, report uh, very satisfactory results with these types of procedures in the general population. I'm not aware of any papers yet published on people with connective tissue disorders in general, but we are collecting data toward that end, and we've been pleased with this type of procedure. And I'll be showing illustrations and examples of these procedures uh, a little bit later in the talk. Ligament replacement is another idea uh, that we've more recently started, last seven years or so. And this involves using materials other than the patient's own ligaments or even donor ligaments from cadavers or other animals, um, instead using things like dichrom polyester and titanium bone anchors to, to try to replace ligaments. Any material that you use, any biologic material that you use to replace the ligament is over time going to be gradually replaced by the host's own collagen, a process called creeping substitution. So as that ligament is replaced with defective collagen, we would expect that construct to fail over time. And we see that a lot where people have had initially successful ankle stabilization procedures that later fail as the ligaments become more and more flexible. Um, the talotarsal joint stent uh, has some history behind it, and uh, we should discuss the goals and objectives, uh, disadvantages and advantages of this particular part of the procedure. This goes back, uh, back at least to the 1940s when Chambers uh, used a, a piece of bone in between the talus bone, which is the one inside your ankle, and the calcaneus or the heel bone in order to limit movement of the foot. Um, and it had some efficacy and was primarily used in children with cerebral palsy and muscular dystrophies. That's my older son again at an East Coast uh, surfing contest. Um, the botanic uh, described using a silicon plug in the 70s to, to plug into the side of the foot and limit motion of the foot. Uh, they try and keep it in its normal range of motion and avoiding uh, overpronation or excessive flattening of the arch. And it worked pretty well, but there was a period of time when silicon became uh, very unpopular when Dow Corning was being uh, sued for breast implants and potential side effects. Uh, unfortunately, that turned out to be more uh, more legal than scientific. Uh, the, the theory was that silicon breast implants caused um, uh, autoimmune disease rheumatoid arthritis type disease. Uh, it turned out people with them had no more incidents than people without them, and so it was a, a big fraud perpetrated by some lawyers who made a lot of money. But that happens. Um, polymer implants uh, were popular when I first started in training 30 years ago and, and still have some use. Uh, these are high molecular weight polyethylene and are, are often um, a little too a little too hard, a little too strong in certain places, and they can fray and fragment. Uh, more anatomically designed implants placed in, in the appropriate places and made out of metals, primarily titanium, are, uh, are probably the most popular and, and most lasting of these types of implants. Uh, absorbable stents have been tried, the idea being you, you put it in temporarily, the, the patient bones realign and form an arch and then you don't need it anymore so it dissolves. Uh, this, at least in people with connective tissue disease, is not a realistic goal. Uh, as soon as the implant dissolves, the foot's probably going to go right back where it came from, right back where it started. Um, so talking about polymers, metals, and absorbables, I'll show you some, some illustrations shortly. 
Uh, that's my backyard, and my son was a surfing trophy. <laughs> and very happy about it. Goals of this procedure should be the relief of pain, improvement in joint alignment and function, interruption in pathological mechanical progression. Like if a foot is operating too flat and it stays too flat, it's going to disrupt other things like the ankle, the toes. Um, it, it shouldn't uh, be left alone to do that. Correction of deformity has a lot of question marks behind it because really what constitutes a normal foot, normal arch height, normal appearance, there really aren't any published scientific parameters on that. This, this is just something that maybe a shoe manufacturer makes up. And they say, well, that's what a foot ought to look like. It ought to fit in our shoe. But there are no real normals stated. There are large groups, um, maybe 30-plus percent of adults probably have a foot that has what might be classified as a lower-than-average arch. Uh, then there's a, a middle 60 percent that might have a, what's called an average arch, and then a, another 10 percent that might have a higher than expected arch. And then all of those feet can go through a lot of changes as soon as you step on them. Maybe the most difficult foot is a foot that has a very high arch and goes past neutral and becomes a low arch, goes through a lot of extraneous and deep and destructive movement. So we're not trying to make your foot look prettier with these procedures or even, quote, normal. Uh, we're just trying to make it feel better and work better. So this is important particularly to surgeons who, if they take their eye off the ball, can have can do harm and can have disappointing, disappointing results. Uh, a little more of that history. These are some of the high molecular weight polyethylene implants that were used in the past. This is kind of a clever one that has a, a little core inside that you, you turn, a, turn a screwdriver and it expands to fit inside of the spot. Again, however, this flexible uh, high molecular weight polyethylene may fray and shred, so we don't recommend it. The molder devices were designed that uh, were intended to be comfortable, but really not weren't anatomical and didn't fit in the place they're supposed to go. So these are some um, modern metal implants that are designed, or, or what we're what we're calling now um, second generation or, or type two. Taylor implants that, that are actually shaped like the place we're going to put them. We'll show you that in a minute. The size of the implant matters quite a bit. That's a pretty good wave for Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, um, and my son doing some craziness in it. Uh, I had occasion to read a study before it was published on, uh, on using what well, was comparing absorbable implants versus metal implants. And they use CT scans to measure the size of the, the place where we put these implants, the sinus tarsus. And it turned out to be a lot smaller than what was previously thought. So you might notice on these implants in the previous slide, they have kind of a long snout on them to fit into that smaller place. And that was wise. Now, this paper did not prove anything as to whether metal implants or absorbable implants have better outcomes but it did provide some valuable data in terms of the size of the sinus tarsus based on computerized tomography scans. Um, this slide's a little out, of, little out of sequence, I apologize, but it does mention that um, problems like, like club feet, severe metatarsus seductus, this is talapezia clonovirus or club feet, are, are more common in people with connective tissue disorders and uh, their manifestations can be more severe and they tend to get worse faster. One thing I, I teach our residents is whatever position a foot may have been born to be in, high arch, low arch, average arch, uh, if there's a problem with the nervous system, the musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal system, the ligaments, it's going to get worse. So if it started out a little bit like this, it's going to get worse. If it started out a little bit like this, it's going to get worse as you bear weight and gain weight and ambulate on it. So, what do we do about these very flexible feet? Well, um, sometimes we replace ligaments like we were talking about. This guy's at uh, Beverly Hills Cosmetic Foot Surgery, which is a term that kind of makes me throw up in my mouth a little bit because feet are, 
these are kind of funny looking at their best. They're proof that God has a sense of humor. So um, trying to make a foot look prettier is, again, not our goal. Well, we do want to make it function better, though. And if you have a foot that has had ligaments that have failed, we can sometimes replace these ligaments with, in this case, stainless steel buttons and strings connecting one bone to another and just kind of tying things back together. Um, advantages of this approach in general are that the materials are probably going to last for eons. I suspect that around Virginia Beach, archaeologists will dig up lots of people with perfectly straight toes and <laughs> bizarre metal and string implants in, the, in their foot bones. Uh, they can be minimally invasive. Sometimes we can do these through tiny little stab incisions with one or two stitches. They may uh, make it unnecessary for us to do bigger surgeries like cutting bones or fusing bones together and therefore maybe permit weight bearing earlier and avoid uh, complications of trying not to bear weight. So I don't work for these guys. Uh, it is a commercially produced video that lasts a, a minute here. But it does illustrate an example of a of a suture and button construct to try to fix a, a bunion deformity. So there's the bunion being sawed off. Uh, the muscle that was helping to hold the toe crooked has been removed. This wire is being placed incorrectly, but that's a whole other story <laughs> for, for foot and ankle surgeons. Um, and then through these holes that have been made in the bones, a button can be inserted using a, a very clever little string construct. And then the, the string can be tightened and the deformity can be corrected. And some modification of this is, is sometimes possible for a person with a hypermobility syndrome. So, for example, this person has classic type EDS. If you look closely, you can see the abnormalities around the knees from old injuries and the skin around the, the shins and how it hasn't healed very well, and uh, clinically moderate bunion deformity, which was causing this patient discomfort and interfering with function. So after failing to find comfortable shoes or effective arch supports and tired of taking analgesics, this patient opted for surgery. So the surgery that we did involved tying these two bones together. You see the little stainless steel buttons on each side and a titanium screw. We did, in fact, cut this bone, but we cut it in a way that the patient could step on it right away and screw, put a screw in there so that she could move her big toe right away and not let it uh, get scarred. And then this is another thing that we were just beginning. This is the medial collateral ligament reconstruction I referred to earlier where there's a bone anchor here, a bone anchor here, and there's actually a little string connecting those two together to help hold the toe straight, hopefully for a few thousand years. And you see nice straight toes. Now, this is a slide describing that, that reconstruction of that medial ligament in detail, but unfortunately we were not able to get the video to work, I think, so I won't be able to show you a video of that tonight. It's just too big of a video. Um, so... Uh, an example of using bone anchors and suture to reconstruct a ligament is um, also by a company called Arthrex, and it's called an internal brace. And they use these different bone anchors, which are kind of like drywall screws, like you, you put them to the wall in your home to keep a picture from falling down. Uh, and they go into the ankle bone and then the side of the foot, and this, this webbing material, like a, like a Boy Scout's belt, is used to replace the ligament that's normally there. This can be done through a very small incision. Uh, it replaces the most commonly injured ligament in an ankle, and it uh, doesn't rely on the patient's own collagen to reinforce it. Uh, it's become very popular in sports medicine, and a growing number of people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome have had this or something like it, often done by us here at Eastern Virginia Medical School. So this is our little our little blue plate special that we've done on a lot of patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome uh, and other connective tissue disorders in which we use one of those stents into the place between the talus and the calcaneus in order to keep the arch a little bit higher and help prevent the foot from collapsing toward the big toe side. We then put bone anchors in the fibula and run suture material into the side of the talus like that internal brace you just saw. 
and also bone anchor into the fibula and down into the heel bone, the calcaneus, to replace the second most frequently injured ligament in ankle sprains, the calcaneal fibular ligament. Now, the calcaneal fibular ligament normally goes deep to the perineal tendons, little tendons that come down the side of your leg here and hook into the side of your foot on the little toe side. These tendons are prone to dislocating and tearing around the ankle bone. So instead of putting the ligament where, or, or the ligament replacement where the original ligament is, we put this string over those tendons instead of under them in an effort to try and keep those from slipping out of their groove. So although it's not an anatomical reconstruction, we think it's actually better. So all the ligaments can be bad, not just the uh, the ATFL, or the anterior talofibular ligament, or the calcaneal fibular ligament. So uh, here's a patient who has had a lot of ligaments come apart on her. We've, we've got a, an implant here to try and keep her arch up. That's an old first-generation type. We've got suture material holding down her torn perineal tendon. We've got a, a bone anchor and suture material holding together her posterior tibial tendon. Uh, we've got, we had to actually cut her ankle bone and swivel it a little bit to try and keep her perineal tendon in place. And after we got all that put together, the ligament that's supposed to hold these two bones started to come apart. And so we had to put bone, uh, bone anchors here and here and run a string right through her ankle bone to try and hold that together. So, uh, with thanks to Matt Damon as the astronaut on Mars, sometimes you just have to science the heck out of it to, to try and get an ankle stable. Sometimes we, we have to move from one spot to the next. This tying together of the two leg bones, we've, we've happily only had to do in a, in, in a very few patients who've had otherwise successful reconstructions in this part of their ankle, and then they started to develop pain between those two bones. And these are some, some bone anchors on each side of these bones with strings between them holding them together. Um, it's been effective in uh, probably about 60% of those we've put it in so far, and we're hoping that over time it may, may prove effective, although one patient got better initially and then unfortunately started to get worse uh, again. So this is still a little bit of a mystery. But it goes along with that principle of we want to limit motion to – but we don't want to eliminate motion and then overload adjacent joints. So in, in both cases, we're just trying to limit extraneous motion. Now, this is something I hope I can get some feedback on in the uh, in the chat and conversation. Um, this is a uh, uh, thing we, we haven't really tried yet on people with connective tissue disorders in our practice, but it seems like a good idea. It uses these little plastic zip ties, just like you, you, you use zip ties in any other application, like to, I don't know, apprehend bad guys if you're a police officer. And they're little micro, micro ones, very small ones. And, and what you do is you glue them down on each side of an incision. Here's a bunion operation, and they're, they're, they're stuck down on one side and the other side with a flexible uh, collagen-based adhesive, and then you pull them. You zip them together, and they stay zipped until the incision heals, hopefully quite nicely. Advantages I see here is uh, uh, it's going to spread out the forces around an incision and make it less likely to tear through the skin or to put too much pressure in one place and not enough pressure in another place. So here's an illustration of a transcutaneous oxygen measurement using fluorescence angiography. So this patient has been injected with a dye that can only be seen with an infrared camera. And that dye fluoresces when it is struck by a laser beam. It, it excites the molecules of the dye and it, and it gives off in, infrared light. And what you can see is areas where there's lots of oxygen in the tissue and other areas where there is, um, or, I'm sorry, where there's not enough oxygen and other areas where there's almost too much oxygen. So as the zip tie is put on, you should be able to even that out and keep the oxygen level to the skin more uniform so hopefully the, the skin won't be accidentally squeezed too tightly or not tightly enough and you get the wound to close without strangling it. That seemed pretty clever to me. So that is the end of my canned comments on 
our current approach to foot and ankle reconstruction in people with Ehlers Danlos syndrome and other connective tissue disorders. Um, I do have a short presentation on pain, which I can go through now, um, or uh, or we can go on to the um, public chat. Uh, John, if you're online, maybe you can advise me which way to go with that. Uh, yeah, I'm okay with you going through your pain demonstration if you'd like. That's okay. fine. We have just about five or six more slides here, so um, I'll keep going for a moment here. Uh, you know, pain is, uh, well, uh, a couple hundred years ago, it was it was considered a sin to suppress pain because they thought it was the natural outcrying of the soul. And some of the efforts to suppress it was things like morphine and ether, as often as not kill people. As, I mean, they were out of pain, but they were also dead. So there was a big controversy in medicine. I have an old book my father gave me before I went to medical school called Triumph Over Pain that talks about the, the kind of change in mindset there, which continues to evolve and change. But certainly people with connective tissue disorders can have a lot of pain. Uh, every day and uh, anywhere in their bodies. And so uh, managing that pain is, is a real challenge. Now, the management of pain has become a big problem. You know, we lost uh, 11,000 people in the Commonwealth of Virginia last year, and I think probably about 70,000 uh, in the United States last year um, from opiate overdoses. And probably a lot of those people were just trying to relieve pain or or had accidentally become uh, dependent on opiates um, through the through medical procedures, and then and then unfortunately were either um, e either had bad treatment or or accidental overdoses with um, prescription medicines, uh, or turned to street drugs when they either couldn't get those prescription medicines or thought they needed more than their doctor could give them, and this is. Uh, more people than, uh, than more Americans have died in World War II and, and, and have died from opiate overdoses. So it's, it's become a, a real crisis nationwide, and the statistics on it are just staggering. So we're trying to be very careful about using things uh, like opiates to treat pain, and some people it's certainly appropriate, but uh, also certainly needs to be very carefully approached and, and with uh, – specifically and specially trained medical professionals. Complications like complex regional pain syndrome uh, can occur in anybody, but uh, have been seen in people with connective tissue disorders also. This is not a well understood mechanism. Um, this patient started out with some simple heel pain, had a couple of procedures, went from bad to worse, and you can see the difference in appearance of the normal right foot and the diseased left foot, which has gone on to a, compl a further complication of complex regional pain syndrome called pseudex atrophy. Now, what we think this represents is the, a body kind of overreacting to pain. It had a, a pain stimulus, like in this case a, a torn ligament and some relatively minor surgery, and instead of just having pain temporarily and the pain going away, the pain lingered. Um, we really don't understand why chronic pain even exists. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any evolutionary benefit to it. Acute pain can save your life. If you learn from, uh, from getting bitten by a bug once, then you're not going to go keep messing with that bug and get bitten again and maybe get toxic and die. So it's teaching. It's educational to have acute pain. But chronic pain really doesn't seem to help anybody. But um, the body overreacts. There's initially an excess of circulation to the injured limb, and it can get red and hot and swollen. And the pain is disproportionate. It demonstrates a thing called allodynia, where we can brush your foot with a cotton ball, and it'll feel like, it'll feel like barbed wire. And hyperalgesia, where we can poke you with a little pin, and it'll feel like we hit you with a baseball bat. So is, this is disproportionate or atypical pain uh, left alone. And if the patient is immobilized for too long, this pain can turn from 
uh, or, or the, the foot can turn from hot, red, and swollen to shriveled, blue, and cold uh, and become essentially permanently useless. Uh, so that's that's the worst outcome with the complex regional pain syndrome. And unfortunately, suicide rates are quite high in people suffering from this. Nearly everybody who has it has had some sort of emotional stress, either simultaneously or, or uh, chronologically proximate. That doesn't mean, though, that it's all in your head. And you can look at this patient's foot and tell, well, that's that's not... That's not something they're imagining. That's something that is actually happening. But emotional stress releases certain chemicals in your body, in your bloodstream, that can cause the circulation to be altered, um, and that may be a part of the syndrome. So I guess the, the take-home message for the audience is if, if you have had an injury, uh, even if it's a deliberate one by a surgeon, and your pain is uh, disproportionate, and it's not going away, and in fact, maybe it even is getting worse. It's not something to be ignored. It's something that may require some prompt treatment. Now, we were trying to figure out how to diagnose this. There is no acid test way to, to tell if someone has this. So that fluorescence angiography that I mentioned earlier with the zip tie is um, is a technique we can we can use to try to uh, to understand this. So if we put a patient who has one foot that hurts too much next to a reg to their other foot, we inject them with this relatively or almost entirely benign dye, activate activate this laser, turn out the lights and let the machine do its thing. It w it will uh, it'll show us where the circulation is is normal and where it's abnormal, and presumably at any stage in complex regional pain syndrome, the two feet will look different. So if someone has suggested, or if, if you think you might be experiencing a complex regional pain syndrome and someone's telling you you're just crazy or a wimp or something like that, you could request this test to show them that, no, in fact, there is something physiologic going on. And, by the way, if both you come out the right, the same color, you can thank your lucky stars that it is just in your head and you go to your psychiatrist and hopefully they can help you get through that. But um, if you have, in fact, complex regional pain syndrome, you need very specific intervention. You need it quickly. So that's just something we've worked out recently and done some publishing on. This was a video to show you the dye going into the foot, but unfortunately we weren't able to get that to play. Um, but here's a static picture of a foot with complex regional pain syndrome, actually the same one you saw in the earlier slides, and an abnormal distribution of circulation. Um, you can even see on this one the difference in the in the hue, uh, much brighter in the uh, uh, in the normal foot versus the diseased foot, which now is is becoming cold and dark. So this uh, paper we published not long ago, or a poster we published not long ago. So what do you do about pain uh, in your extremities? We have a lot of options, more than we do, say, for example, in your back or your internal organs. So we can uh, get at the nerves in the feet more effectively with topical compounds, and a lot of these have been thought up and, and tried with, with mixed results, but some very effective. Uh, patches containing different compounds to, to be delivered transdermally through the skin of the foot or ankle directly toward the nerves there. You know, one nerve on the top of your foot is the only nerve in your whole body that you can see on the surface. It's called Lamont's nerve. It's named after Harvey Lamont, one of my old professors at uh, at, at uh, Temple University. And he um, uh, noticed that all the other nerves in the body are pretty well covered up by fat and muscle. They're protected. But the... Uh, uh, Lamont's nerve you can see on the side of your foot over by your fourth toe and behind it up to your ankle in, in a lot of cases. So that's a nerve you can really get at. In fact, in self-defense classes, they tell you to stomp on that nerve when a mugger grabs you from behind. You stomp on the top of his foot. You hit that nerve, he probably will let go. Transcutaneous electronic nerve stimulation, using electrical energy to confuse the nerves and, and try to block that pain. Uh, it can be more effective in the foot and ankle than it might be in other parts of the body. So even if you've tried it on your back or your neck and it 
may or may not have uh, provided adequate pain relief. It, it's something we use on the foot and ankle regularly, as well as other forms of energy like cold lasers and uh, infrared radiation like anodyne treatment. This phosphonates have been experimented with for the treatment of uh, complex regional pain syndrome. Um, there is some data, particularly from Europe, suggesting it might be helpful in stopping that process. These are also used to strengthen your bones, um, but they can have some major side effects. Like they can also weaken certain bones and lead to catastrophic things like your hips breaking simultaneously or spontaneously. Something I should probably insert here is hyperbaric yeah. oxygen. Um, there are some uh, some freestanding hyperbaric uh, treatment centers that um, are being used for things like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, complex regional pain syndrome, uh, opiate uh, withdrawal, and seem to mitigate some of the symptoms of those horrible diseases and problems. So that really is the end of my slides now. Uh, I'm going to click on the questions and answers and try to start. It says, can sagging arches be addressed conservatively with a physical therapy to strengthen foot muscles and or taping of the arch? Uh, That's an excellent question. Um, and um, I think possibly is the qualified answer in terms of physical therapy. Um, I certainly know physical therapists who have told me that they can improve the function of a foot through exercise. Uh, I know that there's data showing that in, in populations that never wear shoes, they seem to have less arch-related problems than populations that wear shoes all the time. So the use of shoes and arch supports can be a little bit of a, of a trap, kind of a double-edged sword. Now, in Virginia Beach, we have all extremes of weather. You know, it's uh, uh, over 100 degrees today with the heat index, and walk around barefoot on these streets in Virginia Beach will be a bad idea, or even on the beach, without shoes. And we, it also snows here sometimes, and sometimes a lot. So we got to have shoes when it snows. So shoes are a necessary evil where I live. Um, maybe closer to the equator, you can get away without shoes a lot of the time, but um, the, it is thought that maybe... Uh, muscles in the feet can atrophy and that this can contribute to a sagging arch. So it seems logical that strengthening those muscles might improve the height of the arch. I will say that the, the downside of exercise, now everybody must exercise, period. No argument. Everybody absolutely must exercise. The human body is designed to move. It gets stronger the more you use it. But how an individual exercises should be very carefully thought out with what what the individual wants to do and likes to do, what their orthopedic surgeon tells them their shoulders can or can't do, what their podiatrist tells them their foot and ankle can or can't do, what their cardiologist tells them their heart can or can't do. This needs to be a very carefully thought out thing. But you must exercise. So I often highly recommend things like aquatic exercise, which a whole lot of people, even people with connective tissue disorders, often can do effectively. Now, the cool thing about exercise is it can take you about 10 weeks to develop any notable improvement through exercise, but it only takes about 96 hours to start to atrophy. So I guess the, the shortcoming of exercise to build an arch is that it, you're definitely going to have to stick with it to have any kind of effect. It's not going to be a one-and-done thing. It's going to be a lifelong commitment. Um, so... Uh, there was a study done in children who were forced to exercise their arches and, uh, and uh, compared to another set of children that were allowed to just go out and play. And the ones that just went out and played had better arches than the ones who did the exercises. So um, I guess your best bet is to find an exercise that to you is play, that, that's fun. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dissuade people from exercising, but I don't want it to replace uh, healthy recreation. Um, as far as tape, we use tape frequently for acute injuries. Uh, by the, the fact that it contours to the foot perfectly is probably superior to any kind of arch support that could be fabricated for you. So I guess there's an advantage to tape. 
but there's a practicality problem. Keeping tape on your skin all the time can, can certainly lead to skin problems, and some people's skin just can't tolerate it right from the start. And you better remove it carefully if you have classic type or you're going to have another problem, a wound. So uh, tape can be used at least for acute problems and, and maybe for acute exacerbations of symptoms, uh, like kinesia tape uh, can be self-applied in some cases with, with a little bit of education and, and be useful. What's your next question? Yeah, the next question is, how common are the internal ankle braces? How common? Um, in Virginia Beach, very common. <laughs> we put in hundreds of these things and uh, and tracked many of them up to as long as seven years and generally found very satisfying results. They're not perfect. Um, the knots can come untied. The Bone anchors could conceivably loosen. You can get an infection with any type of surgery where <laughs> the things might conceivably have to be removed to treat an infection, but all of those things have been really extremely rare or unheard of in our patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome so far. I'm knocking on wood as I speak. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we use them a lot. In fact, I, I saw a patient just recently who came from another region of the country for a second opinion, and a, a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon had suggested that they do an internal brace to help stabilize the ligaments of this uh, young person, young athletic person with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, and I was pleased to see that, that, that this this other surgeon had kind of thought it through or maybe they read some of our stuff and said, yeah, this might not be a bad way to approach this, as opposed to the more traditional ligament reconstructions, which uh, I don't know if, if members of the audience have had good outcomes with, but I have certainly seen patients who have had plenty of bad outcomes or, or disappointments would be more accurate. They had maybe initially good results, but then they just failed rapidly. Okay. I hope, here's the that, I hope they'll become more common. Okay, sounds good. What is the difference between flat feet and pronation? Ah, good question. Um, so pronation is is a normal movement. Your foot is defined as a mobile pronating adapter. It's a it's a sack of bones that at a particular point in gait is supposed to be loose and flexible and able to adapt to things like gravel and sand. And then at another moment, it's supposed to be a stiff lever to help propel you forward or up a flight of stairs. Um, an over-pronated foot is one that maybe goes flat and loose and stays that way, but doesn't necessarily have a, a flat arch. It may have, it will usually have a lower than average arch, um, but not necessarily flat. Now, there are other feet that are almost physiologically flat. They're just kind of flat all the time, and they really don't go through a lot of that movement. And there may be advantages and disadvantages to each type of foot. There was a study done on Israeli army recruits, and they found that the, the patients who had very low arches had a low incidence of stress fractures in their tibia uh, when they were in training in their leg bones. Um, stress fractures are common in military training. They're sometimes called march fractures. So you take a kid who's not accustomed to running a lot and you put a, a backpack on him and tell him to run all day long, things break. Uh, it happened to my father when he was first in the Army. Still, he made it to uh, the Ardennes campaign in the Battle of the Bulge and back in one piece, so I guess it, it worked out. Um, now, people with uh, very high arches don't have as as or, or they, they are more inclined to have uh, stress fractures in their leg, but they're less inclined to have stress fractures in their foot. The people with flat feet have stress fractures in their foot. So, you know, there's no perfect foot for every situation. Uh, if you live in the sub or super Saharan Africa, you, you might be better off with a flat foot. If, you, if you're walking on streets in Virginia Beach, you want a probably pretty average height, a medial, medial arch height. There are other deformities in the transverse plane, like that, that one metatarsus adductus we mentioned earlier. It can have a foot that is both overpronated and a relatively high arch at the same time. 
So the back of the foot can be overpronating, but the front of the foot can look like it's got a normal to high arch. Um, so it, it gets a little complicated when you're asking flat foot versus pronation. Pronation, a normal movement up to a point. Flat feet, a normal foot in certain circumstances. My observation of people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, looking at those x-rays from Detroit Children's 25 years ago, uh, showed that a lot of the feet just kind of sagged. It didn't necessarily overpronate. It just drooped. Because if you looked at the foot on an x-ray through the uh, sideways, you could see all the joints on the bottom of the foot basically booking open and kind of pinching, shop, uh, pinching tightly at the top of the foot because the ligaments that were supposed to hold those bones together on the bottom of the foot were stretching out of shape. So we refer that, our residents refer to that as the sagging foot that we commonly see with people with connective tissue disease. Okay, here's the next one. What causes pain in the bone surrounding the big toe extensor tendon, and what can be done about it? The bone surrounding the big toe, which tendon? Uh, E-X-T-E-N-S-O-R. The one on the top of the foot. Okay. Um, Well, a lot of things can do that, but one of the more common, in uh, particularly in people with a hypermobile or maybe a flatter foot, is the, the big toe joint can jam, and it can damage the cartilage on the top of it. If you imagine you have the the first metatarsal, the bone behind the big toe, will angle down toward the floor at about a 15-degree angle. And then the big toe should stick out parallel to the floor as you're standing on it. That's the normal arrangement. And as you step forward, that big toe is going to slide up a little bit and then slide back down, and it's going to go through a normal movement. Now, if you take that metatarsal, the bone behind the big toe, and you make that parallel to the floor also with a very low arch or overpronated foot, and then the big toe tries to slide on it, it really can't, and it'll jam at the top and create damage to the cartilage, a condition called hallux rigidus. Now, initially, this will probably not be visible on an x-ray because it's cartilage damage. Later on, the bone will often build up around it and create spurs and things on the tops and the sides of the bone that can be seen on an x-ray. Um, it is a bad condition. It's a, it's a degenerative joint disease. It's a wear and tear type arthritis. It can be very disabling. Uh, there are lots of different ways to treat it. Um, it's one of my favorite things to treat because people come in in quite a bit of pain and they often can be effectively treated and relieve their pain and improve their function. If you have to have arthritis, it's not the worst place to have it, but it's po- thought to be pathomechanically induced joint disease. Joint doesn't move through its normal movement, so it wears out prematurely. What else you got? Okay. <laughs> Good questions. This is a uh, smart audience. It, it, I knew I knew you guys would be smart. That's why I gave you the doctor <laughs> version. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. It says I live in the heartland of Iowa, and EBS knowledgeable physicians are rare, and I have traveled great distances for diagnosis and care. Are you taking <laughs> new patients? And you know, how realistic is it to travel to Virginia Beach for a foot surgery? <clears throat> I'm wondering about follow-ups especially, and I have one uh, hypercure already and need the second one, but I have some complications with ligament repair, and the implant has been fine with no problems at all. Well, I'm, I'm, the hypercure is the implant that I'm using currently, so I'm glad you chose that one, and I hope that's working well for you. Uh, the um, the ligament repair, you know, I don't know how they tried to do that, but um, we have some ways that we think are effective. And we have had people come from much further away than Iowa. <laughs> We've had people come from Norway, uh, from a dozen different states so far. Uh, we are well set up. To, uh, to to have visitors from all around. We are a regional medical center. We actually have a little hotel in the hospital called the Guest Quarters. It's uh, some old hospital rooms they converted into like, uh, you know, Howard Johnson's level kind of, kind of hotel, maybe three-star hotel. Um, 
so we have people who come in often on, say, a third, they'll fly in on a Thursday night. We'll operate on them Friday morning. They'll stay in the hospital overnight for pain management in what would be considered an outpatient observation status. And then they'll move into the guest quarters for the weekend and come over to the office on Monday and be examined and hopefully transferred to the care of a local doctor and sent home. Um, so we do that almost every weekend lately. Um, and people from, as I say, all over the country and even other parts of the world. So we are well set up for that. Now, that having been said, I've given lectures in uh, a whole lot of states and several countries on this topic to foot and ankle surgeons, and I'm I'm hoping that more and more of them will be able to do it. I'm going to be 60 years old this year. Sooner or later, I'm going to suck, so I want to quit before I suck. <laughs> I'm hoping I could squeeze out maybe seven more years of, of surgery and then maybe just teach, but you know, sooner or later, I'm going to have to hang up the scalpel. So I'm, I'm trying to teach others how to do this, and it's really not that big a, a learning curve. It's just a matter of principles. Um, there is a podiatry school in Des Moines uh, and some professors there who I I speak with regularly, and uh, we might even be able to get you up there and get proper care. And at the very least, they could give you an assessment of what's going on, and, and if they think that you need to come to Virginia Beach, it's a really nice place to visit, particularly in the fall. <laughs> now, uh, it does take a while to get an appointment, um, at least several weeks uh, to get an appointment for us to sit down and visit, and a few months to schedule surgery. So, um that can be a confounding factor, but um, hey, I'm glad I have a job. I count my blessings. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Um, I'm not quite sure the question, but let me read it. Uh, what kind of shoe do I wear? Question mark. I do better barefoot, where I can feel the ground beneath me. Many. Plain shoes have a sole that is too thick for me, and I'll fall over, twisting more ligaments and causing stress factors. Uh, I think it's kind of a recommendation for shoes. I'm not sure. It's a good question, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to give an easy answer, and, and I'll probably talk more than you wanted me to. But uh, everybody's foot is shaped differently. And by the way, everything I'm about to say about shoes applies to orthotic arch supports also. Um, everybody's foot can be a little different. They're not quite like snowflakes, but it's pretty close. Even your right foot can be quite different from your left foot. And so saying that a particular shoe and saying it's going to work for any significant number of people is, is going to be wrong. Also, I will maintain, and we've been saying this to our patients a lot recently, is that you might need different shoes for different times of the day. Certainly, shoes have become very sophisticated for specific purposes. So you have volleyball shoes and boxing shoes and wrestling shoes and martial arts shoes. I mean, every kind of shoe you can imagine, somebody's making a shoe for the activity you want to do. So you, depending on what you want to do with the shoe, you may be able to find one that's designed specifically for that purpose. I'd also contend that let's say you have a, a normal 9-to-5 kind of schedule. In the morning, you just hit the floor. Your feet might, might not be too tired or too sore yet. You might benefit from a from a better arch, a firmer arch that's really going to hold things in line. But also, it's going to be kind of hard. So maybe halfway through the day, maybe by lunch, that art that hard arch support might be starting to bug you, and it might be a good time to switch out to a softer one. Well, let's say it's the weekend and and you want to go walk around a bit. You might not want to start out with that hard arch support. You might want to start out with the softer one right from the beginning and uh, and not beat your foot up too bad and just figure, well, this is a day my foot's not going to get any better, but I'm going to, not going to try to make it worse either. I tell nurses that work in the operating room to wear hard-soled shoes like dance goes because they're not taking that many steps. They're moving a few steps here, a few steps here, they're, they're next to the patient being operated on most of the day standing up. And that hard-soled, stable shoe is a good thing to stand on. Then nurses that work on the on the floors and have to hustle, you know, 30 feet, 40 feet every 10 minutes or, or just continuously going up and down hallways, 
they're often better off with a little bit more flexible shoe, more shock absorbing like a running shoe. So I did not successfully answer your question at all, except to say that having a variety of options is probably wise. Maybe a couple different types of arch supports, maybe a soft one, a medium one, and a hard one. And maybe a couple different types of shoes, soft, medium, hard, for different purposes, and be prepared to switch maybe partway through the day. So bring a different pair of shoes to work with you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, here's another one. I live in Tucson, Arizona. I've been to numerous professionals and not much help. Uh, there's no specialists here. Recommendations on care. I have flat, collapsed feet. The pain goes to the top of my uh, gastrocnemius. Uh, you pre- but creating a cyst. I get Baker's cyst, but more of a cyst below that near the insertions of the upper gastroc. G-A-S-T-R-O-C. Okay. Um, so you, there is a podiatry school in Arizona now. Um, it's a Midwestern school. Uh There are only nine podiatry schools, but so far we're two for two as far as people living near one. Um, So I and I know some of the faculty there. And again, it it wouldn't be a bad idea to go to the podiatry school. I'm I'm pulling up the uh, uh, podiatry school. Um, I'm pulling up the the location of the school. I know Arizona is kind of a big place. Um, Let's see. School put out, it's in Glendale, which is not that far from uh, Tucson, if I remember correctly. But um, might be worth a trip up there to be assessed. I think the faculty probably wouldn't mind calling me on the phone and sending me electronic data, and we can put our heads together and see if we can figure out a way to help. Um, you might be an example of that that situation we talked about where your foot can be very flexible, your ankles, your knees, your back, your shoulders, but your Achilles tendon could be too tight and tight enough to the point where it tears the gastrocnemius muscle away from the back of your thigh bone and creates Baker's cysts. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's not unheard of for you to have the kind of pain you're describing. Um, and it's uh, it can be very germane to the... Uh, to the hypermobility syndrome. Okay, here's another one. I'm not quite sure, uh, but uh, my surgeon is paranoid at this point. He suspects mast cell activation syndrome. (laughs) And I know that's been discussed related to many of our EDS uh, activities and, and symptoms. Well, I might be paranoid, too, because I kind of believe in it. <laughs> I'm not sure how it works. Uh, I'm not an expert in endocrinology but, uh, or rheumatology, but I see a lot of people who have signs and symptoms of what looks like an autoimmune disease, too much inflammation, mast cells in excess quantities. And I think, well... You know, I don't think ehlers Danlos Syndrome is an autoimmune disease, and yet these people are having signs and symptoms of autoimmune disease. So uh, that, I think, is explained pretty well by the, the theories on mast cell activation. So um, I'm not sure your surgeon is paranoid. You may very well have mast cell activation. Now, also, you may or may not be having the right kind of surgeries, no disrespect to your doctor, and I don't know anything about it, so I'm certainly not judging them. But um, we know that a lot of traditional surgeries used for hypermobile feet in the past haven't done well based on our observations. Now, I'll qualify that statement. Our observations are anecdotal. I see a lot of people with ehlers danlos Syndrome, maybe as many or more than anybody in the world, because just about everybody's got foot problems, Right. And uh, I could see a lot more patients in a day than these uh, poor geneticists like Dr. Frank Romano, <laughs> who is absolutely wonderful and knows more about ehlers danlos Syndrome and her little finger than I'll ever know in my whole life. But um, I am able to see a lot of patients 
and uh, our observation is that, that some of the traditional approaches to foot and ankle problems in people with uh, connective tissue disorders don't work uh, in that population. They might work in the general population, but they don't work in the EDS patients. So um, I guess maybe you know other opinions about the foot and ankle surgeries wouldn't be a bad idea. But yeah, you may very well have mast cell activation. Uh, it's something I don't fully understand, but I, I'm kind of impressed with the theory. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, my son has very flat feet, and he pronates. He also has, and you're going to help me. You have to help me with this. Uh, Been doing well so small. far. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've got. So many medical terms of this. I'm going to spell it for you. Uh, S e s a m o i d i t i s. Okay, sesamoiditis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and postural uh, uh, vascular uh, issues. Um, he, he has custom orthotics, but they don't seem to be helping. Sesamoiditis is hard. It's uh, there's these two little bones underneath your first metatarsal head, right behind your big toe, called sesamoids. Some people have as many as four, but standard issue is two, and they can become injured and inflamed and stay painful for years because every step you take, you're stepping right at it. They're like little miniature kneecaps. Your big toe joint is very much like a small knee. It has a lot of the same anatomy as a knee. And it's these little kneecaps, when they get bruised or cracked or uh, their circulation gets interrupted through trauma, they, they don't tend to do very well. So um, it often requires some very creative uh, orthotic protection to avoid stepping on them repeatedly. Um, sometimes they need uh, the assistance of things like bone stimulation. So there are machines that generate electromagnetic or sound waves in an effort to make injured bones heal. Now, getting an insurance company to pay for one of those $3,000 machines is tricky, but not impossible. Um, imaging to find out just how severe the injury is, such as MRI, is often valuable, and CT scans can also be valuable there. Um, and we've developed some minimally invasive surgical techniques uh, where we try to stabilize fractures of the sesamoid with little two millimeter diameter screws percutaneously inserted. So, so there are ways to treat sesamoiditis that you may or may not have already tried, but I think the critical thing is a, a, a real good diagnosis. So getting those sophisticated images and then moving on from there is wise. Question. Um, maybe you can, uh, give us a summary, uh, Dr. So uh, where do you think this uh, technology is going? How are, are we doing some research in ways to make better improvements? It sounds like you have since the last webinar that we've done. And where, where do you think we're going with uh, uh, foot and ankle uh, treatments for particularly EDS and those that have connective tissue disorders? Well, I've been really blessed in that about the same time that I started studying this, uh, large orthopedic companies developed a kind of an interest in foot and ankle surgery. Prior to that, all we did was steal spare parts from other surgeons and uh, used them in the foot, but they were never designed for the foot. But now large companies like Stryker find that their their number two product line is is foot implants. Arthrex has a big interest in it. Uh, there are lots of different companies that are spending a lot of uh, research and development money on trying to come up with better ways to treat foot problems, um, sometimes just more expensive ways, not necessarily better, but also better. And uh, that is great for you, for me as a surgeon and for you as a patient. Um, the, the fact that implants are being designed with a specific uh, – target, uh, a specific problem, uh, can only lead to better outcomes um, with experience. And, and well, uh, I've been running a residency program here for, for 
for 20 years, and I've had uh, 25, about 30 graduates now who have seen a, a disproportionate number of people with connective tissue disorder problems in their foot and ankle. And those people are going to go out and run teaching programs and have their own residence, and they're going to propagate some of the principles that, that we have tried to develop and that we hope are right. Um, I, I guess I'll find out after I retire because <laughs> uh, a lot of times outcomes can take years or decades to develop. So, you know, I'll, I'll be dead before some of the kids I'm operating on now are mature enough to know whether I really did them a favor or not. But unfortunately, that's the nature of medicine. It's my hope, belief, and expectation that my trainees are going to keep the research going. They're certainly highly encouraged to do so while they're here and that um, years from now we'll have some some answers as to whether or not we've been doing the right thing. So far, our short-term research has been really promising. Most of the things we've recommended have panned out pretty well for most of the patients we've done them for, and it's very gratifying to me. So, um, you know, it's kind of a a, a good um, uh, nexus of, of different uh, ideas and technologies that have come together that I think are going to help people with at least the foot and ankle problems. And, you know, if you look for an explanation for some of the – some of the, uh, the other problems with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, like postural, uh, like POTS, like um, mast cell activation, you got to think that bad biomechanics probably contribute to a lot of that. You know, if you have low muscle tone through lack of exercise and your legs dilate too fast and your heart rate goes too fast, that may be something that, that could be improved through more exercise. And if I can improve your foot and ankle function to the point that you can exercise more, I can't help but think that's going to lead to better quality of life and maybe less complications with connective tissue disease. So I'm optimistic, bottom line. And the recognition, the recognition has gone up so much. When I started this 30 years ago, when I went to that second annual national meeting, we thought EDS occurred in one out of 750,000 live births. That's what the textbook said. Now, you know, but halfway between now, then and now, they were saying maybe one in 150,000. Now they're saying as many as maybe one in a thousand people probably have some sort of connective tissue disorder, genetic connective tissue flaw. And the simple recognition of connective tissue disorders by a variety of providers, primary care physicians, rheumatologists, orthopedic doctors, podiatrists, that can't help but bode well for people who have these problems. So unlike your dear wife, who had to wait decades before she was ever properly diagnosed, I've got kids coming in my office who are, who are six years old, and they've been accurately diagnosed because someone looked. Someone noticed that, you know, the regular stuff wasn't working and this kid was having problems, and, oh, hey, look how bendy they are. And, you know, they did bite and scale, and they did a little reading, and said, you know, there's a lot of literature out there now. Your CME program going to help this a lot, I think. The more doctors that know about it, maybe us doctors can finally start catching up with you patients who have, for, for most of my career, know more about it than we do. Well, that sounds like an excellent summary, and uh, we buy into that uh, uh, 100%. And we see improvements. We want to see many, many more, and we really appreciate your focus on those people with connective tissue disorder, particularly uh, our EDS members. And uh, that is one of the primary problems is just walking and being able to be comfortable. And, uh, and their feet are extremely important to be able to do that, to get the exercise they need. So uh, we really uh, applaud and, uh, you and congratulate you on the focus that you're placing on, on this particular uh, area of the uh, population. Well, I'm grateful to the patients who've been patient enough to watch, to work with me as I learn and, and try to figure out ways to help. Yep, yep, incredible, incredible. Okay, well, I think we're 
we're going to wrap up this evening and, and appreciate those that have attended and we will be we have are recording this and it will be uh, posted on our site in, in a couple of days and thank you again uh, dr Agnew, for your third presentation for our, our uh, educational uh, series and My everyone pleasure. have thanks, a, thanks for attending and thanks for the questions have a good evening good night good night